Hey everyone, Ahmed here, and today we'll be talking about pulmonary emboli. Now there are a number of things that can embolize to the pulmonary arterial vasculature, and it's pretty well summarized here by the fat bat mnemonic. So we have fat, air, thrombus, bacteria, amniotic fluid, and tumors. All of these may cause pulmonary emboli. And I'm really sorry for fat shaming fats. Now, do you know what fat emboli are usually related to? Yeah, so we have long bone fractures like this femur fracture on this x-ray, orthopedic procedures, and liposuction. Yeah, that's fat in a big tube. Pretty disgusting. So it's thought that in these scenarios, small fat particles leak into the venous system. Fat is then hydrolyzed by lipoprotein lipase, and free fatty acids are released into the circulation. Now, despite their name, these fatty acids aren't supposed to be free in the circulation. And as a result, they damage the endothelium. When it's the endothelium of the lungs that's damaged, patients develop acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And so they present with dyspnea and hypoxemia. And this is by far the most common manifestation of fat emboli. When they damage the endothelium of skin capillaries, it results in petechia. And when it damages the endothelium of the brain vessels, it causes neurological abnormalities, like cognitive deficit. So now we've created a triad of hypoxemia, neurological abnormalities, and a petechial rash. Other findings include anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure. Now, the drop in platelets and hemoglobin occurs because the fat molecules literally act like a sticky fly trap towards platelets and red blood cells. Now, I know some smarty pants out there who have a light bulb for a brain might ask, well, if these emboli originate in the venous system, then how on earth do they make their way to the systemic circulation and cause neurological abnormalities or renal failure? Well, approximately 20 to 30 percent of the population have a patent foramen ovale, or a PFO, which allows these emboli to go from the right atrium to the left atrium, and ultimately the systemic circulation. One way the boards may trick you is they'll give you a trauma case and tell you, well, fat globules were found in the urine. Intuitively, you think, well, they gave it away. Board writers aren't getting any smarter, are they? I mean, come on, exam writers, step it up. But let me tell you something. Fat globules in the urine is not specific nor sensitive for fat embolism syndrome because they may appear in the setting of any trauma. Now, this is an H&E stain of a blood vessel in the lung showing fat within it. As you might know, fat appears white on H&E staining because when the slide is washed with alcohol, the fat dissolves. Okay, we got air emboli next. These are pretty rare, and risk factors include surgical procedures, since blood vessels are commonly damaged during surgery and are often exposed to air. This is especially more common in neurosurgery and laparoscopic surgery. A lot of neurosurgical procedures are performed in the sitting position, so the exposed cranial veins are now at a higher level than the heart. This means that the pressure within the cranial veins is negative. And what does negative pressure do? It'll suck air in. As for laparoscopic surgery, we add an air source by insuffilating the cavity with gas. So that would just increase the risk that an air embolism would happen. As you can imagine, any blunt or penetrating trauma would also be a risk factor. Another important risk factor is decompression sickness in rapidly ascending divers. This is also known as caisson disease. Finally, us healthcare practitioners can also cause it. The atrogenic causes include mechanical ventilation, causing barotrauma, which is pressure-related rupture of the alveoli. And based on the image, can you guess the next risk factor? Good eye. That's a central line. And air may also be accidentally injected during central line placement. Okay, so how do patients with air emboli present? Venous air emboli obstruct the pulmonary circulation, 
causing sudden hypotension, hypoxia, and distended jugular veins. These emboli can also get to the systemic circulation, causing stroke, myocardial infarction, or renal failure. Diagnosis can be made with an echocardiogram, and the echo will show air in the right heart chamber. The treatment of air emboli is actually pretty cool. We place the patient in a left lateral decupitus position with the head down. What this does is that it traps the air embolus at the apex of the right ventricle, which moves it away from the pulmonary outflow tract. Unfortunately, the patient must remain in this position permanently. Um, obviously kidding. <laughs> Eventually, a central line is placed, and the air embolus is aspirated. Okay, we'll leave thromboembolism till the end, because it's actually the most important. The next two are pretty self-explanatory. Bacterial infection refers to septic emboli that usually result from endocarditis. The bacterial vegetation breaks off the valve and essentially becomes an infected clot. Also remember that metastatic tumors can seed into the circulation and obstruct the pulmonary circulation. Okay, next up are amniotic fluid emboli. The pathophysiology is actually quite complex. It's thought that fetal cells and debris leak into the maternal circulation, initiating an inflammatory cascade. Now think, when would the amniotic membrane be disrupted? Right, during labor. So naturally, most patients present with this during delivery or right after it. Risk factors include age above 30, multiparity, and trauma. These might seem like random risk factors, but the way I think about them is what would make the amniotic membrane weak and thin? So age, going through multiple labors, and any traumatic incident like placental abruption. Patients present in a way that resembles anaphylaxis, and so it's called an anaphylactoid reaction. This causes cardiorespiratory collapse, which manifests as hypotension and shortness of breath. Also, systemic inflammation can cause disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. Sorry, remind me, what is DIC again? Excellent. DIC is widespread activation of the clotting cascade, causing the body to essentially use up all of its available clotting factors. This presents as thrombosis first, and then once all the factors have been consumed, the patient begins bleeding. The classic tip-off on board's questions is an oozing IV site. Do you remember what the peripheral blood smear showed in DIC? Yes, so we have schistocytes and helmet cells. Unfortunately, the only way to confirm the diagnosis of amniotic fluid emboli is with an autopsy, and it classically shows fetal squamous cells within the pulmonary circulation. All right, on to the big one. Look, if you slept through the other types, totally fine but now's the time to wake up. Generally speaking, when you hear someone say pulmonary embolism or PE, they're almost always talking about thromboembolism. It's like the default setting. It's like when you think of a phone, you think of iPhone, right? You don't think of Android. Sorry. The vast majority of pulmonary emboli arise from deep vein thrombosis in the lower extremities. Although most DVTs occur in the calf, these don't always embolize. The most common site of embolizations to the lungs is from the proximal iliofemoral veins. Now, the risk factors for a PE and DVT are centered around Virchow's triad. So we have stasis of blood flow, endothelial damage, and hypercoagulability. I'll go into more detail on these in the DVT lecture. But here, let's focus on the pathophysiology of PE. What happens is that the pulmonary blood vessels are occluded, so the lungs aren't getting perfused adequately. Okay, question. Is ventilation impaired in pulmonary embolism? No, it isn't. So if perfusion is messed up, but ventilation is fine, what would we call this state? Yes, a ventilation-perfusion mismatch, or a VQ mismatch. 
The severity of the symptoms therefore depends on what? It depends on the size of the embolus. A smaller embolus would only cause VQ mismatch in a small portion of the lung, whereas a larger embolus would cause greater VQ mismatch. When a massive embolus obstructs the main pulmonary trunk, it's called a saddle embolus, and this one is particularly life-threatening. Okay, so because there's VQ mismatch, the affected portion of the lung is now dead space. There's no blood going to it, so respiratory exchange doesn't happen properly. It's kind of like oxygen is at the alveolar bus station, waiting for the bus, which is hemoglobin. Unfortunately, there's a traffic jam upstream, and so oxygen can't catch a ride. If a significant segment of the lung isn't participating in gas exchange, the overall oxygen saturation drops. In other words, hypoxemia. Now, what's the lung's response to hypoxemia? Yes, by means of the peripheral chemoreceptors sensing the hypoxemia, hyperventilation occurs. The remaining normal lung increases ventilation in an attempt to compensate. As a result, the lungs blow off tons of carbon dioxide. So if you did an arterial blood gas analysis, or an ABG, what would the acid-base picture look like? Right, so you'd get respiratory alkalosis. Also, how do the pulmonary blood vessels respond to hypoxemia? Right, they vasoconstrict. This shifts blood from the underperfused segment to the perfused segment. It's kind of like the lungs recognized the traffic jam and said, okay, everyone, the 401 heading to the right lower lobe of the lung has been obstructed. Please use the 423 heading to the left middle lobe. This is called shunt because blood is being shunted from the occluded segments to the well-perfused segments. Okay, now remember, these PEs usually happen suddenly. So, imagine the right ventricle happily pumping against the low-resistance pulmonary circulation until all of a sudden, a big fat pulmonary embolus is stuck right in front of it. The right ventricle screams, No, I wasn't ready for this. She wasn't ready, people. I don't know why the right ventricle is a she here. But anyway, the patient may suffer right heart failure, resulting in hypotension and potentially shock. This type of shock is called obstructive shock. And this is why some people with massive PE may actually present with syncope. I know some of you might have thought of cardiogenic shock, but that refers to left ventricular failure. Okay, now why aren't we saying pulmonary infarction? I mean, we use the term myocardial infarction. Well, unlike other areas of the body, pulmonary infarction rarely happens, even if that branch is completely occluded. And that's because the lung parenchyma has additional blood supply from the bronchial blood vessels, which branch off of the aorta. But if the lungs get infarcted, is it an ischemic or hemorrhagic infarct? Right, it's a hemorrhagic infarct. So this can cause hemoptysis, or it can irritate the nearby pleura and cause pleuritic chest pain, which is worse with, right, inspiration. Okay, now that you understand the pathophysiology, let's put this all together as clinical presentation. So patients with PE present with acute onset shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis, or even syncope. On examination, they are usually hypoxemic, tachypnic, and tachycardic. Hypotension may be present, and an ABG would show respiratory alkalosis. Oh, and one more thing. If I asked you, does the hypoxemia in PE correct if we give 100% oxygen? No, absolutely not. Because the problem is not ventilation, it's perfusion. Adding more oxygen molecules at the bus stop will not make the bus come. There's a traffic jam. Okay, the ones in red are almost always present. The others may or may not be present. The clinical workup of PE 
is actually quite complex. And I think it's more step two content, but there are some things that you should know. The diagnosis is made with a CT pulmonary angiogram. Here's a CT showing a filling defect in the main pulmonary trunk due to a saddle embolus. The ECG usually only shows sinus tachycardia, but sometimes it shows a pattern characteristic of PE, and that's an S1 Q3 T3 pattern. So you have an S wave in lead one, a Q wave in lead three, and also an inverted T wave in lead three. Okay, aspiring pathologists and forensic scientists, it's your time. Say a patient unfortunately passes away, and we don't know the cause of death. Now after death, blood stops flowing, right? In other words, stasis, right? Since that's one of Virchow's triad, what would happen to the blood pooling in the pulmonary arteries? Yeah, it's going to clot. But now, since we don't know what caused this patient's death, how can we tell on autopsy if a thrombus formed before or after death? It's the lines of Zahn. These lines are made of interdigitating platelets and fibrin, which appear pink, and RBCs, which of course appear red. And these lines only form in living patients. So if they are present, we know that the patient unfortunately died from a PE. That's all folks. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Until next time, goodbye.